Hi and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is dedicated to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Ronald Gassane, and today we have with us Mike Padgett, who will be discussing with us a very central subject, and that is of atheism. First of all, welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Rommel. I'm really glad to be back. It's a real pleasure to have you come and share some of your insights with us. Now, on the last episode, we were able to talk about the change that God made in your life. And you spoke to us about your background, your history. You used to be an atheist, mm. but we were unable to delve into this subject. And what I'd like to do on this episode is really explore what atheism is. Let me first start off by asking you, define atheism. What is it? Why don't we start with the word itself? Uh, atheism actually comes from a Greek word with another very little Greek word at the beginning. Uh, a theos. A theos. And a means without and theos means God. Without God. That's all atheism means. It means a worldview that is without God. But that doesn't quite tell us enough. You see, there are in fact many spiritual worldviews which don't believe in a God. Uh, in my part of the world, in Australia, we have many, many Buddhists, for example. Uh, Buddhists don't believe in a God. And so purely according to that definition, they are atheos, without God. Or there is a movement in the West called the New Age, uh, a fascination with the way in which the spiritual side of things is connected with nature. Most New Age believers don't believe in a God either. They are atheos, without God, atheists. But that's not the way we usually mean it. Uh, usually, when we use the word atheist, we mean someone who is convinced that there is no God, and not just no God, that there is no spiritual side of the world either. Uh, they are what some philosophers call metaphysical materialists. That is, metaphysically, thinking from the broad, deep, spiritual side, if you like, they believe there is nothing but matter, nothing but the physical things you see, nothing but the things you hold in your hand, and nothing behind it at all. And that's what atheists believe. To be honest, sometimes some atheists in recent years have played with that definition a little bit. Rather than saying they believe there is no God, they simply say, we have no belief of God at all, and therefore we have no burden of proof to demonstrate that there is no God. I think most atheists would agree that that's a little bit slippery. You can't pretend to have no belief about something as soon as it's raised. You either believe that it's true or it's not. If I were to say to you, Rommel, pink unicorns. It's not possible for you to have no belief about pink unicorns. You either don't believe they exist, believe they exist, or you're not sure. But any of those is a position. Possibility, yes. Exactly. And the position that most atheists hold, and the way in which I think we can probably define it and not make too many people upset, is by simply saying atheists believe that there is no spiritual dimension to life. There is no personal God, but no impersonal spiritual power behind the world either. Now, would you say that there are a lot of atheists in Australia, in other parts of the world, Western parts of the world, developed, undeveloped countries, what would you say? There are many atheists. In fact, I think there always have been many atheists, but it's never been the dominant position of mankind. I think throughout the history of the world, as far as I'm aware, human beings have always had a sense that there is something more to the world. In fact, the Bible suggests that we should expect that. I'm going to open my Bible uh, to a section called the letter to the Romans, written by the great apostle Paul. And he says that what can be known about God is actually evident among all the people of the world, from Romans 1 verse 18, because God has shown it to them. In verse 20, he says, from the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, having been clearly seen, being understood through what he's made. Christians and most people throughout history 
believe that there is something in the world that speaks of the existence of God. And most people throughout history have believed that there is something, someone behind what we see and feel. Atheists, though, have always been in there. There have always been some people who've looked at what they see and have interpreted things differently and decided that the evidence is not convincing enough for the belief in a God or gods. Now, there's another word that quite closely marries up with atheism, although I believe that the definition is somewhat different, and that is the word agnosticism. Please define that for us. Agnosticism is a word I like. I like agnosticism because I think it portrays what is often the most honest position that humans hold. You see, uh, agnostic is another English word that comes from Greek. Uh, gnosis is knowledge. A, uh, remember from earlier, it simply means without. Agnostic means without knowledge. Agnostics don't claim to know anything. Uh, they hold a position where they are not sure if there is a God, and they're not sure if there isn't a God. They don't know. And if we're honest, if there were no evidence, that is a great and honest position for people to hold. We don't know if there's a God. We can't see him. We can't touch him. That's right, yes. Now, statistically, what sort of percentages are we talking about here? I mean, is this like a minority? Is it a major majority? Is it something that's becoming more and more popular? I mean, I think prior to the 18th century, you wouldn't hear too much about someone that was an atheist or an agnostic. It might have been something that they weren't sure about. They perhaps doubted, but they did retain some elements of belief in God. W would that be fair to say? When we go back to the ancient Greek world, uh, we read of the Epicureans uh, who were convinced that there was no God. Wow. So the, the belief that there is no God is a thread that stretches throughout history. It's quite old. It's very old. Uh, it appears in most cultures at some point or another, which by the way is an important point. Uh, atheism is not some sophisticated modern development or reaction to our primitive past. Atheism as, is as primitive as any spiritual or religious worldview. However, you are right. Certainly in the Western world or in most parts of the world for the last two centuries, atheism has very much been in the minority. I can't speak statistically about many countries, but in my country, Australia, around about 18.6% around about tell us that they are of no religion. Now, that's from our national census. That's an increase of about 3% from 2001. So it's clear that there is an increase in those who say they are of no religion. But that doesn't tell us as much as we might think. You see, that no religion group, I think is probably as flexible as that definition of without God. There are many people who don't associate themselves with a particular form of religion, a particular denomination of a church, for example. And those people are quite likely to tick that box. You see, let me give you some other statistics which I think will make my point. 18.6% of Australians say that they are of no religion. But let me read to you some other quotes about Jesus. 42% of Australians believe that Jesus had divine powers. 54% believe he rose from the dead. 63% of Australians believe in miracles and that belief has actually been increasing over the last few decades. So I think what we're seeing is the steady collapse of something called Christendom, that period when the church and society in the West were one and the same. But we're seeing a resurgence of spirituality for people are just not convinced that there is nothing behind this world. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because some people that you do talk to and engage with, they'll say things such as, God is dead. And what they mean by that often enough is that God is no longer needed. In our advancements with our technological uh, age and, and the things that we've come up with and the mechanisms that we've designed, 
we no longer need God. We can understand, we can explain uh, how things work and thus we no longer need God. So God is dead. But what we find quite simply is that, as far as I know, is that the Bible is in fact still the biggest selling book of all time. And that's an amazing thing because it, it suggests to me and to many other people, like you mentioned, people still have that spiritual hunger, that spiritual thirst, and they still want to know why we're here. And they ask those big questions. So does the atheist ask the big questions? Why are we here? You know, why, what, what, what's our purpose in life? Do they ask some of these types of questions? One of the things I love about atheists is that atheists are atheists because they're confident that they are using their minds to think through things. In fact, one of the things I love about atheists is they are people who are using their minds to think through the biggest of questions. And so they're always asking questions. I think it's very hard to be an atheist and not constantly be looking to know the world better and to ask deeper questions about what you may in the past have considered to be a settled truth. So yes, I as an atheist asked the biggest of questions and I wasn't alone and I am constantly meeting other atheists who, true to the integrity of their claims, won't let what they once believed to simply lie and be assumed but continue to pursue an investigation of Christianity and of other religions. Yes, thank you. Now you read, I believe, from Romans chapter one a few minutes ago. I did. And so it seems there that the Apostle Paul, some 2000 years ago, was dealing with this problem. Like you said, it's not a, a recent issue, but what was, he, what was he expressing there to the people or to uh, the readers of that letter? Paul's great concern was that People were living in the world and they saw the world around them, the world that had been made by a God who delights in making wonderful physical things. And yet despite seeing that reality clearly before their eyes, a reality which pointed to God, they chose not to investigate it, chose not to pursue it, chose in fact to pretend it wasn't there. He says they denied God. And in fact, they became darkened in their minds. That is, rather than their sight being clear, their minds being active and rational, it's like they switched off the lights because they didn't want to deal what they saw to be true from the world. So is this an intellectual issue with the atheist? So say I would like to talk to an atheist. I know there's a number of atheists and I want to, I want to enter into the subject of Christianity with them. How do I approach it? Do I approach it from an intellectual stance alone? My experience uh, as an atheist myself is that my problems with the claims that Jesus made, for example, occurred at two levels. There was the intellectual level. There were questions that I had, problems and issues with what I thought I understood but I also now know, looking back, that there was something else going on. That in fact, God had made clear to me the truth of his existence. And I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to accept it. And I think there is a reason for this. If I can be bold, I don't think there is actually any such thing as atheists. I know that's a big claim. If you'll bear with me, let me try to prove what I mean. Uh, by there being no such thing as atheists, what I'm not saying is that there is no one in the world who doesn't believe in supernatural realities. Uh, certainly, there seem to be many people who claim not to believe in some kind of a supernatural being or power. But one of the things I love about the Bible is it's not so narrow-minded as to restrict the notion of God to something purely supernatural. You see, everyone has a God. What do I mean by that? Well, a, a God is something which you trust to either give you your deepest desire or protect you and rescue you from your greatest fear. Just think about it. 
If your greatest desire is to be financially secure in your advanced age, then the thing you are going to pursue above all things will be your career. You will make sacrifices to it. You will worry about it. You will devote energy to it. You will invest time in it. You will put it above other things in your life. And it has become, in every functional way, your God. Or, or say, for example, your great fear is that one day you might suffer sickness and illness. Then what you will do is you will invest inordinate amounts of time, energy, money in keeping fit, in alternative medicines, in moving to a more healthy location. And that is effectively your God, your health. The Bible speaks of this in various ways. For example, Jesus in Luke 16 verse 13 says, you cannot serve both God and money. You see, he's saying that money can be a God to us as well. Uh, or similarly, uh, Paul talks about people who are greedy, seeking after possessions. He says in Philippians 3 verse 19, that their God is their stomach. You see, we all have gods things in which we've put our trust. And the problem is, it's very, very hard to take your trust from one thing to another. One of the very hard things for atheists, for example, is to take their trust away from their reputation and take the risk of exploring the claims of Jesus. It's very hard to be an atheist and do that because it requires you to have the courage of your convictions, to really use your mind and not worry what other people think of you. To in fact, take a risk that your God is not the real God after all, and that there is a bigger God who has all the things you've been looking for all along. So would it be a misconception that an atheist doesn't doubt, doesn't regret, or I shouldn't say use the word regret, but doesn't have doubts or questions their eternality. Would that I, be a misconception? No, I, I, I think it is a great misconception. Uh, there is something about the human condition means that we are always confronted by the realities of this world. It, it, it's impossible to get near to death, for example, particularly of those whom you love. And in that moment, not wonder if there is something else behind that wall, it's impossible uh, to find your future threatened and not wonder if in fact there may be a God with his hands outstretched to catch you. The atheists from my personal experience are full of these doubts just are, as are any person. But of course they face the great problem. They believe in the absence of a God. You cannot prove an absence. And so they can never look for proof that their belief is real. As opposed to Christians, I discovered when I went from being an atheist to becoming Christian, Christians in times of doubt and concern, for all people have those times, can look to the cross and the evidence of the claim of Jesus Christ to be reassured that they are on the right path in life. I'd like to take... Uh daringly the position of an atheist and I'd like to say to you well look you're talking about death approaching death it's quite a difficult thing to be able to approach death and not be affected by it but I mean how do we know what's on the other side of death I mean how what evidence does Christianity give to show that there is life after death that's a great question and it lies at the very heart of the Christian story, of the Christian claims, of the Christian evidence, which is the basis for belief. Yes. You see, Christians believe, and not because we want to believe necessarily, but because we've been persuaded, Christians believe in fact that someone has gone beyond death and come back to tell us about it. And we don't believe that because we think this happens every day. The fact that this lies at the heart of the Christian claim is because precisely it is a unique event. Why do we believe that? It is a strange yes. thing, isn't it? Because yes. uh, after all, we know that people when they die do not come back to life, except of course in TV shows. 
That's right. I mean, you often hear, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. That's right. And so it would require, surely, for a thinking person, for someone who was of integrity in their use of their mind, to go from being an atheist who believed that there was no such thing as life beyond death to becoming a Christian who believed that not only was there life beyond death, but promise of a wonderful future beyond death. But that's what happened to me, and I'd like to tell you why. It's because the evidence is so extraordinarily persuasive. The evidence of the stories of those people who followed Jesus and who had nothing vested in it. You see, I think sometimes we think that there is lots of good reasons why people would have claimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Just look at how rich the church is today and how wealthy so many, many of its priests. But in Jesus' day and in the day of his followers, there was nothing, nothing for those who believed in the resurrection of Jesus but suffering and death. And yet they did in their hundreds. And they didn't believe it because someone told them initially, but because in fact hundreds of people had known and followed him and they knew him to die. They saw him in fact upon the cross. He was placed in a tomb for three days. We know that not just from the accounts of Christians in the gospel, but from other writings, from other scholars and historians of the day who were opposed to Christianity. And by the way, in case you haven't worked it out, a tomb is not a great place to put someone whom you want to recover or come back from the dead. It's a place where you put someone when you expect them to stay dead. And yet Jesus' followers claim to have seen Jesus on the third day, risen from the dead. Now, it is possible, if some have suggested, that maybe he just woke up again. Woke up after having been crucified. Woke up after having been stabbed in the side, lain for its wonderful recuperative effects on a bare stone in a tomb, leapt out and persuaded his disciples just before he fell over comatose that in fact he was risen from the dead and had conquered the grave. If you believe that, you're far more credible than those who believe the gospel accounts, I'm afraid. And I wasn't persuaded by that story. I was convinced, as I think all people will be who read them, that the gospel accounts tell the story and provide evidence of the one who conquered the grave. And because of that, we can trust him. Who else has promised that he would die and rise again like Jesus did and then gone on to do it? Yes. And I think it's the one thing that troubles everybody is their mortality. You know, the 70 or 80 or 100 years that we live here, at the end of it, really, what's it all about? I mean, death is almost like this cold blanket that you just put over yourself. You have to accept it. It's a horrible thing. It's a cold thing. It's an eerie thing. You don't want to do it, but it's an inevitability. You know, and this is the way I find an atheist's outlook on life, their, their worldview on life. And I, and I suppose why I invited you here is that a part of the things that you're talking about is you're showing, no, no, you don't have to just simply take that position. There's another position that you can take. And this position is filled with life, with hope. And you can see that there is life. And we have that hard evidence in the scriptures, in the Bible, of Jesus himself who died, he was buried, three days later, he rose again. And not only did his disciples see him, but we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that over 500 people had witnessed his resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's overwhelming evidence. How can you refute that? You know, I mean, the, the disciples themselves, as you had mentioned before, why would they be willing to lay the, their lives down for something that was hocus pocus, mm. for something that was just uh, an invention mm. or that what people just simply just, you know, a bunch of people got together, conspired, let's just write this story up and turn it into a religion. No, people are not fools. People are not persuaded by things mm. like that. So what would you say to an atheist who perhaps he's never heard this stuff before. He's never heard uh, a Christian declare the gospel in this way. What would their next step be? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to take a slightly roundabout route to that, if, okay, you, if yes. I may, uh, because uh, there is something I think I want to say to atheists at this point. Having been an atheist and heard this account several times before I realized how true it was, it took me some time to grapple with something. 
You see, uh, if you're an atheist right now, you may well be tempted simply to dismiss this, to say that it is unpersuasive, unconvincing, and that you have come to a rational decision that it cannot possibly be true. But here is a problem I find atheists face. You see, if there is nothing but this physical world, then everything that happens, happens purely because it is causal, because something else has happened. There's nothing behind the physical world, so the only reason a ball goes into a ring is because a hand has thrown it. The only reason a tea goes into a mouth is because someone has lifted the cup. The only reason you think a particular thing is because a few moments ago, some chemicals in your brain did something else. And in fact, if you believe in nothing but a physical world, in theory, if we went back 100 years and knew the exact state of the universe and how all the atoms would bounce around, we could predict how the atoms in your head are bouncing around right now. Wow. Which means that the concept of rationality, of thinking, of even free will, is a fiction for atheists. It's something that they like to believe in, but it simply cannot be true. For either, for those of you who have a scientific frame of mind, Newtonian physics is what holds, where one ball bounces into another and it goes off in an exactly predictable direction, in which case your mind is predictable a hundred years ago, a million years ago, a billion years ago, if only we had enough information. Or you follow uh, Einstein and you say, well, no, in fact, uh, it's quantum physics, in which case everything is random. In which case, your thoughts aren't rational either. What would you like them to be? Predetermined or random? Those are the only choices you have as an atheist, which means that your decision to dismiss the Christian claims can't ever be reasonable or rational of itself. It means there must be something behind it that makes it possible for us to think and to process, and I'd ask you to give pause a moment. If rationality is possible, if thinking is possible, what else might be possible? What else might have happened? What other things might there be worth looking into, such as, for example, the evidence of Jesus Christ? And the place I would start would be with a Bible. Get yourself a Bible and a book or online and start reading one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. Start at the beginning. Don't stop till you're finished. And see if then you can claim that there is no truth in the story, in the claims, in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Mike, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. We've run out of time, but I think we definitely need to continue and do a second take of this episode because it's such a big subject. And I think it's something that people do deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, people that are for and people that are against. Thank you once again for sharing, sharing some of your thoughts and insights with us. I hope to our viewers that we haven't offended anybody. We haven't upset anybody by the things that we're talking about. Honestly, our motive is love. Mike's and mine, it's love. It's simply to reach out. We don't want to argue with anybody, but we want to show that there is reason to believe. Please stay tuned for the very next episode of Misconceptions. And until then, may the Lord bless you. Thank you.